Thank you for waiting. We're going to have now the, the next talk in a completely different subject. So Carmen Santos, Carmen Zula Santos uh, of the Center of Marine Sciences in Faro, Portugal, is going to talk about microplastic retention in marine coastal canopies. Please, Carmen, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I was having a technical problem. Okay. So, can I share the... Yeah, you can start. Okay, so, um, good, mo uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carmen Santos. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Marine Sciences of the University of Algarve. And uh, I'm presenting today um, um, the results of a couple of studies we have conducted recently regarding the, uh, the role of uh, marine canopies in the trapping of um, plastic particles. Um, well, uh, the marine pollution by plastic doesn't need uh, presentation. Uh, we all know that uh, every year uh, tons of plastic enter into the ocean and there are still many questions that arise about the effects and the, um, and the fate uh, that this plastic, uh, plastic has in the, in the ocean. Um, this is uh, one of the top 10 questions about this problem and uh, they range from the effects that they can have in the fauna and in the plants in the ecosystem in the, in the ocean and also uh, there are questions about the policies about uh, uh, how we can reduce this uh, um, plastic that enter into the ocean. Um, but one of the uh, most important questions is where ends these plastics? Um, until today, we, uh, plastic have been found in many uh, type of ecosystems from the deep ocean to the surface ocean to the coastal areas, but uh, there are still many gaps. And um, with, the, with this uh, study, what we wanted to, uh, to advance in this uh, field is about uh, the fate of microplastic in a certain uh, coastal ecosystems. Uh, we focus in this uh, vegetated canopy from habitats that uh, are sea grasses, mangroves, salt marshes, and macroalgae because uh, they are very efficient particle filters. Um, this, uh, this ecosystem, as we can see here in this diagram, have a three-dimensional structure, uh, the canopy, that are in contact uh, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the water column. Uh, because of this interaction between the canopy and the water, the energy is dissipated and the waves are attenuated. This, um, as a consequence, uh, facilitate the particle dropping and the position uh, in the canopy and in the sediment. And um, this, um, this uh, canopy structure also helps to stabilize the sediment because it's a, it uh, avoids the resuspension uh, of the particles once they are deposited. And uh, finally, um, these, uh, these uh, processes facilitate as well the burial of the particles into the sediment because in, uh, in just a few words, once you enter into the canopy, it's very difficult to get out of it. So um, my question was, if this happens with uh, particles such as sediment, uh, phytoplankton, and any other small particles that are in the, in the water column, can it happen as well with uh, plastics? So um, to reply to these questions, um, the goal was to assess the role of marine the data canopies on, on, on this plastic trapping. And um, we conducted uh, two, uh, two studies. One was observational in the field, and the second was experimental. In the first one, we wanted to, um, to study uh, the occurrence and the abundance of macro and microplastics in the sediment and in the canopies of intertidal and subtidal coastal, coastal vegetated areas. Um, just here, I want to explain that macroplastic are loose particles that are bigger than five centimeters, and on the opposite, we have microplastic that are the small particles, less than five uh, millimeters. And in the second uh, study, we wanted to assess the, prob the probability of this trapping under um, um, 
under control condition in, in, uh, in, the, in the lab. And to identify which are the drivers that can explain the retention and the accumulation of uh, microplastics in the, in the canopy. Um, so the first study was uh, part of uh, Lorenzo uh, Cozzolino's uh, master thesis and that uh, was done in collaboration with two colleagues from the CCMR, uh, Katie Nicastro and Gerardo Sarri. And um, what we did was to select uh, four types of uh, marine canopies in the Rio Formosa Lagoon, which is a coastal lagoon in South, uh, in South Portugal, here next to the CCMAR. And um, two of the uh, canopies were intertidal and two were subtidal. Um, in the intertidal, we selected seagrass of Steranolti and salt marshes Partina Maritima, and in subtidal, the mix, uh, mixed meadows of uh, Simodosa and Odosa and Sostera Marina, two seagrasses and also the macroalgae called herba prolifera. Um, we studied the presence of uh, macro and microplastics in, uh, in both the canopy and in the sediment of these, uh, of these uh, habitats. And uh, we compared it with nearby areas uh, without vegetation. So what we found um, here, uh, we have a, a, a plot in which we have at the, at the top, the uh, abundance of microplastics in the sediment. Uh, in the second uh, panel, we have the abundance of microplastic in the canopy. And uh, on the bottom, we have the microplastic in the sediment. What we found is that first, in non-vegetated habitats, there were not trapping at all of microplastic, big plastics. Whereas uh, in Espartina Maritima, uh, especially the salt marsh, in 85% of the observational plots that we uh, assess, uh, they presented uh, uh, macroplastics. The second key finding was that um, in, the, in the canopy, uh, in the leaves of this uh, vegetation, uh, we didn't find any uh, mi microplastic there to the leaves of uh, Spartina, while for the other species we found, and especially for the subtitled ones, those that are exposed during a longer time of periods to the water column. And especially Sostera Marina, in Sostera Marina, we found that almost 60% of the leaves that we assess present uh, microplastics. And this uh, can be explained because uh, this uh, species has, uh, has um, uh, high uh, air leaf area. Uh, in fact, as we can see in this plot that I show here in the corner, we can see a relationship between uh, the area of the leaves and the occurrence of microplastics in them. So those plants with uh, shorter leaves present uh, less, um, less, uh, less in, uh, with less frequency uh, microplastic out there to, to the surface. And uh, when we look at the uh, accumulation of uh, microplastic in the sediment, surprisingly, we didn't observe any difference uh, between the habitats. I mean, uh, both vegetated and unvegetated uh, habitats presented a high uh, concentration, but there were not differences among them. And uh, the occurrence was uh, in between 80 and 100%. Um, when we look at the type of micro of uh, plastics particles that we found, um, we can see that uh, there were some patterns regarding the shapes, uh, which is the first panel, color, the second, and the size uh, uh, of the of the particles. Um, especially for for microplastic, we found that the most common one was fibers, and specifically blue fibers. We, we don't know which is the origin. This type of description that normally helps to um, um, identify which are the sources of the dust that we found in, in the field. And uh, we also observed that most of the uh, microplastic were in, this, in, the, in the range of from zero to two uh, millimeters in size. And uh, for macroplastic, we found that uh, most of them were of the type of fragments and films uh, which are related to human uh, activities and products that are normally used for, for food and beverages. And um, well, in, here in the picture, we can see some of those particles that we found and, and that blue uh, 
fiber that was so common in, in most of the samples. So um, in summary, what we found with this uh, study is that uh, the plastic debris occur in, uh, in the canopy of most of the species that we uh, studied. Uh, only in the salt marsh uh, was not observed. Probably this is related with the uh, position that this ecosystem of, of, uh, occupy in the in the in the detectable area, which is the um, uh, in the lower part, but it's, but they don't are flooded as much as the other uh, canopies. We observe that uh, the there are uh, microplastic in the sediment of all the habitats, and uh, we observe that uh, the uh, marine canopies are efficient trap trap trappers for macroplastics. In the second uh, study that we conducted, and this was done in the framework of the assembly class, I was uh, granted with one of the transnational, uh, transnational access grants to visit uh, the Christina Berg uh, Marine uh, Biology Station in Sweden. And uh, we conducted this collaborative uh, study um, with uh, Eduard Infantes and Anna, Anna Saracran. And uh, I visited this, uh, uh, this place because uh, Eduardo has this film uh, tank, which is a facility that allows us to, um, uh, to control uh, biophysical conditions to, uh, to run experiments, especially under different uh, flow velocities. So specifically, what we did was to um, construct uh, marine canopies uh, at uh, different levels of complexity from zero, that is a bare sediment, to high, uh, dense, uh, highly dense uh, canopies. We use um, as model the species uh, this seagrass, uh, eelgrass, Sostra marina. And then we use a model particles for industrial uh, pristine pellets, which are particles made of uh, polymers of, uh, that are used to fit stock in the, in the plastic industry. All of them were less than five millimeters, and uh, they range from for, from densities of uh, uh, 0 0.9, that is, they were floating particles, to 1.3, that is, very dense particle. And uh, for the flow velo for the flow velocity, we applied uh, 12 levels from two to 30 centimeters per second. So what we did uh, is to uh, do this simulation until the combination of the uh, factors that I have already explained. Um, we did uh, almost 2,000 trials in total. Each condition was run 10 times. And the particles were individually released in the film tank, and we observed what, uh, uh, which the behavior was for each of them. And uh, we described three behaviors. The first one was that the movement doesn't start. It means the flow is too low to move the particles. The second one is trapped, so the particle will start to move, but then once it enters in, into, in contact with the canopy, it, uh, it, uh, it remains trapped in it. And uh, as a criterion, we use at least one minute of, uh, of trapping in it. And the third behavior was not trapped. It means the particles started moving, uh, it's rich, the canopy, but it's uh, uh, passive. And uh, here in these pictures, you can see one of those uh, behaviors. Uh, in the top of two pictures, we can see one floating particle trapped into the surface because uh, at the low levels, the canopy was touching the, the, sea uh, the water surface. And in the, in the bottom pictures, we can see uh, those particles trapped into the in, on the surface of the sediment in those small ripples that are created at high velocity and also in the eroding areas around the shoots. And these are uh, processes that are also observed in, in nature. So what we uh, uh, observe, this is, uh, this uh, summarizes the, the results of all the trials. We use a multinomial logistic regression model to explain uh, the, the behaviors. Uh, in this model, we use as predictor the three drivers that we, we use, the shoot density, the flow velocity, and the polymer type. And as response variable, we use the particle behavior. 
In this graph, in the, uh, 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 on the bottom, we can see the flow velocity levels, and uh, we can see on top uh, the um, association of each uh, panel to the polymer that we tested, and the different lines are related to the shoot density that we applied. So we have the uh, key finding. So um, we will, um, let's uh, observe the second row of, uh, this, uh, of this figure, uh, in which we show the probability of being trapped under the different conditions. If we observe the red line, we can see that there is no trapping at all in the absence of egress. Okay, this is the zero shoot density. Um, if we observe the different lines within each panel, we can see that the probability of being trapped increases with shoot density. And if we observe, uh, if we compare the behavior of the different polymers, we observe that uh, those that have uh, high density, that is the PA and PET, um, the probability of being trapped also increases. And with velocity, uh, the behavior differ among, uh, among the different polymer types. As we can see for the floating ones, the trapping is higher at low velocity because it's when the canopy is in contact with the uh, water surface. Uh, once the uh, flow uh, starts uh, started to increase, uh, this uh, canopy um, reconfigure with the flow and is not touching anymore the water velocity, so the particle is not trapped. With the sinking uh, particles, um, we observe that uh, the velocity uh, increases the trapping, the, the uh, probability of being trapped. So um, overall, we can see that the three uh, drivers that we uh, investigated are significant in the trapping of the, uh, in the explanation of the trapping of the particles in the canopy. So in summary, uh, the high probability of, of microplastic retention is uh, at low flow velocity and at high shoot density for the floating particles and the very dense sinking particles, while the low probability of microplastic retention is at high flow velocity and low shoot density for the floating particles and the light uh, sinking particles. So the initial question was, can marine canopies filter plastic particles too? And uh, in combination, this study demonstrated that marine canopies may act as barriers for sinks of micro and macro plastic as certain by physical conditions. It is true that uh, we have observed uh, evidences for, for this trapping capacity, but there were also some conditions in which uh, the canopies were not acting as a sink of micro or macro plastics. And um, important uh, findings are also that uh, we identify the key drivers that explain this accumulation of plastics, either the species, the canopy complexity, uh, like shoot density and leaf length, the plastic type, the size, shape, and polymer density, and the flow velocity. These two studies sum uh, to the uh, very recent uh, uh, publications that are also supporting this uh, hypothesis of uh, marine canopies uh, as plastic uh, things. And um, they show that uh, um, there, are, there are evidences to, to support this hypothesis and either in the sediment, in the canopy, and, and also in the fauna that are associated to, to these uh, ecosystems. So, um, to, to end up, I would like to say that uh, these findings uh, uh, let us think that uh, marine canopy forming ecosystem as seagrass, such as seagrasses, salt marshes, and macroalgae should be prioritized habitats in the assessment um, of the exposure and impact of plastic in coastal area and the associated fauna, especially because these ecosystems are important uh, supporters of biodiversity and especially for, um, for uh, juveniles of both invertebrates and vertebrates. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to reply. Thank you, Carmen. Any questions? Um, Carmen, I, I think um, 
So is there any evidence? I mean, of course, you propose there that this becomes a priority for study, but is there any evidence of, of the impact of these microplastics uh, on on this kind of you know the on the on the, the marine plants or, or on whatever is dependent on the marine plants? And, and the other thing is okay, so the plastics are depositing, but then you also have other sediment depositing. So in some ways, it will be they will be buried. I assume, uh, particularly because they are in the sediment. So basically they'll be there trapped for probably for a long time. Um, and, uh, and, and I would say in some ways out of the way. What do you think? Yes, so for the third question, um, there are uh, one single study uh, investigating the effects of uh, plastic bags into the seagrasses, the direct effects on the plants. And uh, what they showed is that uh, the, um, the presence of plastics on top of the plants uh, um, reduced the, um, the flows of gases in between the plants and the water and the sediment. And it creates a, a condition that is not uh, very favorable for, for the plants. The pro productivity is, 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 is decreases, I guess, in some ways. It could decrease. Yeah, I think that was one of the parameters that they assessed. And uh, regarding the burial of the microplastic, uh, yes, yeah, some, some of the studies that I presented in the last slides uh, have recently showed that the accumulation has been increased since the 50s, which is the, the decade in which the plastic has started to be used um, uh, very, uh, very commonly. And um, so there is, a, I mean, it's very clear that the increase of microplastic in the sediment uh, mm -hmm. since then. It's like a register, a register of how it evolved. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else wants to ask questions? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So my question was just if there's any idea how to filter them, these particles out, that's basically impossible, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know exactly how, which are the solution. I think solution for the plastic problem is uh, different levels from, from mm -hmm. waste management of them, the material that they use. Uh, but they already, the ones that are already in the ocean, uh, and I think it's very difficult to to to, to take them out of, of it. Uh, there are mm -hmm. some, uh, technological solutions uh, to uh, that are being um, developed by Dutch uh, uh, Enterprise, and uh, I, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, working to be honest. Um, for seagrasses, there was one very recently published uh, article about uh, the Posidonia oceanica, which is a big uh, seagrass in the Mediterranean Sea. And these, uh, these, uh, the, the fibers of the leaves of this species create uh, some kind of fiber balls that uh, are created because of the wave action. And uh, they uh, show that there are many microplastic that are, um, that, are um, uh, uh, that are kept in, in, inside this. Uh, yes. they, um, they talk about uh, a service of uh, or water filtration. Uh, but my point of view is that if we still do those more are still into the water, uh, they are still part of the problem, right? It is true that they are taking up, the, filtering the particles out of the water, so they are not available for, I, I would say, fish or whatever, uh, but they are still in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I think that the discussion here is, uh, is this a service or a disservice, the filtering of the particles? And I think that we need to uh, conduct more research to, to be able to, to respond to this uh, question. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will, in that case, introduce uh, Tim Wallace and he's already there, ready to, to present, and he's going to talk about studying the evolution of spiralian cell types by single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, Tim is at the University of Vienna in Austria. Please, Tim, go ahead. Thanks a lot uh, for organizing this symposium and having the chance to talk here. 
And thanks for the great support also uh, of Assemble of the program. That's just a, such a great support for so many people, so many young researchers as well. So I really appreciate this. I will um, basically talk about my research today, but mainly focus on introducing those species I'm working in, um, on. Um, I was mainly at the Station Biologique de Roscoff in France, and I'm studying the evolution of spiralian cell types by single cell RNA sequencing. Um, who are the spiralia? Um, so, as you know, the bilateral animals are uh, divided basically in three big superphyla. One of them are the deuterostomes, us, for example, fish, etc. And then there are all the crunchy animals, like the ectisosomes, for example, fruit flies, the elegans, and so on. And then the third superphylum is basically a bit more enigmatic. It comprises two, according to the latest phylogeny, like two bigger groups, like the gnatifera. To those ones belong, for example, the ketogenes or the rotifers, so arrow worms, for example, really important uh, components of the food web, um, of the marine food web. And then we have the lophotrophosomes, a sister group to those ones, and the lophotrophosomes have a basal offshoot, which are basically the mollusca that you can see here, and the entoproctor, they are called, or camptozoa. Both together form the tetraneuralia. They look at least the adults look very different, but um, I will show you later on that they share some uh, traits with each other. And sister to this very uh, phylogenetically informative group are basically all the other lophotrophosomes, like for example, annelids, pheronids, nemertiums, flatworms, and so on. Spiralians come in very different forms. So we have, for example, bryozoans that you can see here on the left side, we have these arrowworms, here we have those ones with shells like uh, mollusks, these polyplacophon mollusks, for example, or brachiopods on this side, and uh, we have numertians as well. Um, and but this was only the um, adult diversity that we have. Now I just show you here the uh, larval diversity, and this is even or, or almost as big, um, if not bigger. And we have uh, uh, polyplacophon mollusks, for example, on this side, like these trochophalabi. We have this endoproct larvae, we have here a bryozoan larvae, and so on. So it's a huge diversity. And this diversity is just made up by little components, like uh, little stones, which are called cells, cells. And we have different cell types, as you can appreciate from this beautiful drawing by Ramon Cajal. It is a retina, and you can see all the different cell types. And these cell types don't look don't not only have a different morphology, but they also have, um, in, in case of neurons, different uh, electrophysiological uh, um, uh, characteristics. They have uh, different locations, so topologies, and different molecular fingerprints as well. But this is mainly studied uh, only in model uh, systems like mouse, uh, drosophila, uh, C. elegans, and fruit fly, for example. Um, it is very important to study this, to figure out uh, what are neurons at the end, what, are, what is the cell type, what is the neuron, for example, because they have very, very different opinion about it. What, are, what is the trait uh, of neurons? Are there neuronal markers and so on across all the bilateria or, or, or uh, metasomes? Do we have something like this? Um, and that is what, where I would like to make um, a contribution to this by studying the uh, tetraneuralia, like the mollusk, um, as representatives of the lophotrop zone, the entoprocts as well, and the ketogenes as gnatiferans. I will start out introducing like Acanchituna clinita, that's a polyplacophon mollusk. If you just have a look at it, you can see that it has like eight shell plates here, not like one in gastropods or two in bivalves, it has eight of them. It has some bristles and also spicules here, like little spines along this one. It can be readily collected uh, in the intertidal range of uh, Roscoff, as you can see here. Um, why did I choose uh, polyplacophon mollusks? I chose them because they belong to the aculiferan mollusks. So mollusks um, are composed of two different uh, clades, like uh, aculiferans and conchiferans. So the conchiferans, all the known uh, mollusks belong to, like gastropods, snails, for example, cephalopods, as you know, bivalves, and so on. Um, and to the other ones, um, rather enigmatic, worm-like creatures belong to, and these polyplacophon mollusks. But 
In contrast to the conheferents, those um, acoliferants, or better to say, like those polyplacophyll mollusks, retained uh, several ancestral features. For example, an elongated uh, anterior posterior axis, uh, staggered Hox expression, for example, of Hox genes, right? Um, and uh, dorsal ventral musculature, for example. And this you don't find in the other ones. Why do we assume that these uh, traits are ancestral? Because we also have a fossil record, as you can see here. So along the way to the recent fauna that exists nowadays, we uh, know many, many fossils that have scars where we know, okay, uh, these scars are from the indention size of um, sites of muscles. So we know how many dorsal ventral muscles this, for example, has or had, or how many shell plates or spicules and so on. And from these ones, and uh, living animals, we, um, we infer uh, how the last common ancestor looked like and looked more or less like a polyplacophon, most likely, uh, but had most likely only one shell plate, not eight. Um, in, uh, many years ago, I used to go to Roscoff to uh, collect uh, the polyplacophons. Right now, I don't have to do this anymore because I um, have them in the lab. So I have a seawater aquarium, uh, aquaria, and I keep them in a lab. You can see here the little uh, trophophor larvae that are circling around this stone. Once you add these stones, they just fall down like flies to the ground and settle down and develop into these miniature forms of the adults. They only have seven shell plates in the beginning. The eighth uh, shell plate uh, develops after a month. And um, right now I still have these uh, almost like, yeah, I would say like two centimeters long um, animals in the lab. I have hundreds of them and they are sexually mature again. Um, it is not really a model organism like fruit fly or C. elegans because it develops very slowly. So I just mentioned those two years or so. So this is not really optimal. Behind my project, there's a rational basically that I just um, RNA single cell sequence uh, selected development stages in adults. And uh, I'm doing this, I'm uh, picking those uh, developmental stages in adults because they have certain larval and adult organ systems are present. Um, a larva has sometimes um, has some, some organ system that uh, vanish with the metamorphosis. So basically they get rid of the ciliary um, prototroph, for example, that um, helps them to feed or to uh, uh, move around in the water column. And uh, of those uh, larval and adult organ system, I'm um, eventually interested in the differentiated cell types, but also um, cell states. So for example, neuroblasts or cells that still differentiate into uh, individuated cell types. Um, then I can identify basically those cell types that give rise to the nervous system, to the shell fields and spicules, and um, draw inferences about homologous cell types in the spiralia or bilateral. Let me introduce the 48 hours uh, trophophore larvae to you. So that's a trophophore larvae that is about to, uh, to metamorphose, to settle down and develop into an uh, adult individual. So on the left side here, you can see the anterior side with the episphere. So that's basically the head. And on the right side, you have, uh, on the posterior side, you have uh, the end here. So here's the foot. And here on the dorsal side, you can see with these bumps, the shell fields. So there are seven shell fields and they're encircled by spicules, little spines here. And what you can see here, he, he, see here is the prototroph that is a ciliary band that helps them to move around in the water column. I didn't mention this, but this is a DAPI staining. So this basically shows all the uh, cell nuclei um, that are stained. And you can see that it has a mouth op opening. So that's uh, through the sagittal, that's a sagittal section through the middle of the animal. You can see it has a mouth opening and then a radular sac that is basically the rasping, where the rasping tum, uh, tongue develops and is situated. Um, that is very characteristic for all the mollusks. And then it also has uh, ventral nerve cords that are a bit uh, yeah, visible here and lateral nerve cords and so on and the shell fields again. Um, let me just quickly introduce uh, single cell sequencing for those of you who don't, who are not familiar with this one. Um, we dissociate whole larvae. So um, we do this with enzymes and by pipetting and filtering and so on. And what you can see here are individual cells after 
the um, dissociation. Um, after we dissociated them, we just feed them into um, a gasket, so which is basically here. And this gasket um, uh, is filled up also with oil and uh, um, 10x barcoded gel beads. We can basically uh, see this here. So uh, in this pipeline, first of all, the barcoded gel beads are fed in, and then the cells come here into this one and are encapsulated in an oil bead, uh, in an oil uh, droplet. Those ones are then collected, and later on, they're reverse transcribed. So in each of those oil droplets, we basically have the, all the reagents for the reverse transcription. Once they are reverse transcribed, we have a cDNA library of all of them together. The oil is then removed, um, and um, then we have a mix of the different uh, cDNAs, but each of them is barcoded, so we know from which cell it is actually derived from. So at the end, we have transcriptomes, so information about the RNA that is expressed in every single cell, basically, of, of the organism. And we can see this here, for example. These are, and these cells are then uh, organized or, um, yeah, characterized by the transcriptome, and it is, uh, um, they are analyzed which genes are uh, expressed on a higher level together in certain cell types, and then the cell types are clustered, and we can come up, we, we have uh, different cell types or cell states, as you can see them here. Here they're just numbered, so they just have different numbers. And on this, uh, on the y-axis, you can see the different genes. Many of them are not really annotated. They don't, they haven't been described yet. And that is just a very short list, but you can see that the bigger, for example, this dot is, the more of the cells in a cluster um, express a certain gene and the more, the, the, uh, more red, this, uh, this one is the stronger it is expressed at the end. So we can see here a cell type that is highly individuated. It has many genes that are highly expressed, but they are not expressed in other cell types. So with this one, if we cluster them, if we do um, have a uh, two-dimensional representation of this one, this is a U-map. It is called, it's a uniform manifold approximation and uh, projection. Um, representation of all those cell types that exist in this drop volabi, we can just um, find different cell types. For example, we find uh, cell types that make up the shell fields, for example, the spicules, or we uh, can uh, find cell types that make um, um, the cerebral, so the anterior nervous system, for example, that we have here, or the motor neurons, for example, right? The sensory cells. If we then have a closer look at the cell type tree, we can see that, for example, here, that the shell fields are, um, the shells that make up the shell fields and spicules are closer related to the cerebral uh, nervous system than, for example, to the motor neurons. So normally, uh, uh, in, in former times, one thought that uh, the nervous system would be derived from one source. In polyblockoffer and mollus, for example, and many spiralians, this is just just not known until now where the nervous system de is derived from, and what kind of genes they express. So this was uh, sort of surprising that we could say, okay, there's two different sources of a nervous system here. So those motor neurons cluster more closely together with the sensory cells, such as photoreceptors, for example. If we have a look at this gene co-expression modules, so here on, the, on this axis, we have the cell types again, and here we have groups of cells that express certain genes. We just see that those two, for example, here on the right side, like the shell field cluster and the neurons in the cerebral region, just share many of these modules together. So many genes are shared among them. If we then have a look where they're expressed, so they're expressed here in the epical region on this side, for example, here's the protoprotrop with the cilia, here's the shell field. And this is just a confocal scan to locate them here. So the red staining is this certain gene that is expressed here. So here, these are those cerebral um, uh, neurons, uh, cell types, and um, those ones are closely related to those ones that are expressed in the shell field that we can see here. So here we have a double staining, like a hybridization chain reaction uh, staining, and we see that we have uh, the different genes expressed in different cell types. So there are also different cell types in the shell fields, for example. That is another cell type of the shell field that you can see here that is heavily expressed in the first shell field. Then if we compare this one to uh, the uh, other 
neurons, then we just see that there's basically no connection at all. So very, very few genes are only shared between those these neurons and those ones uh, that are in the motor neurons, for example, or in the sensory neurons. Um, the sensory neurons are, for example, the photoreceptors that you can see here on this side here, here, or also in the apical region, like in the apical ganglion. And these are the motor neurons in the ventral nerve cords, so that you just have an idea about where they're located. Uh, so in summary, we can just say um, this um, uh, single cell sequencing really helps to identify cell types and epithelia, and it gives rise, if it works well, uh, it gives, uh, provides a highly detailed map of the larval body plan. We can just say that we have a very similar gene ex co-expression modules in the um, anterior, so cerebral neurons and the shell fields. So this could be an indi um, indication for of shared developmental history or even evolutionary history. And then we have both clusters that co-express very few genes with the motor neurons and the sensory cells. And uh, so this might indicate that there's a divergent development in the history of the uh, cerebral neurons or episphery neurons and the motor neurons. Um, this is a bit like an outlook that I give right now. So in order to study this in more detail, I will have a look at uh, other developmental stages of this chitin, of this polyplacophon monos, as well as um, um, close related species or clades, such as the entoprocts, for example, the camptosomes. I will just briefly introduce the camptosomes to you right now. This is basically um, an animal group that looks very, very different. They have a stalk here, they are filter feeders, they look a bit like bryozoans, for example. Um, this, they come in colonial forms or in uh, solitary forms, like this loxosoma, for example. And uh, they are called endoprocs because um, they have their anus together with their mouth in this tentacle crown, it's, which is a bit awkward and which, div uh, 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 and, um, which divides them basically from other uh, clades such this, as the ectoprocs, bryozoans, which have their anus outside. Um, they look very different as uh, adults, but if you have a look at the creeping type larvae, as the larvae, then you find some similarities. For example, if you have a look at the nervous system, the nervous system of uh, polyplacophorum mollus is uh, composed of four nerve cords, like two ventral nerve cords and then two lateral nerve cords. And if we have a look at this immunostain, it stains uh, serotonergic neurons of a neurotransmitter um, in the creeping type larvae, we just find them expressed, or uh, we find these uh, ventral cords and the lateral cords. So we have something very similar as we have it like in uh, polyplacophorans. And this gave also rise to the name tetraneuralia, so four nerve cords. Um, so um, in uh, my assembly stay at the uh, Station Biologique de Roscoff, I uh, collected these creeping type larvae from these adults here. And I did this uh, with this research vessel with the um, help of um, the fishermen. On the way, when you're collecting, you can see even seals here that you can see here, for example, it's a really beautiful station. And then um, you, we, we dredged and we uh, found these uh, little endoprocs basically in the shells of uh, some bivars. And um, back in the lab, they uh, give rise to, um, they um, release their larvae which then can be um, collected. Uh, during this time, I was able just to uh, um, uh, figure out or establish uh, the uh, dissociation protocols for this single cell sequencing, which are quite tricky sometimes, but in this uh, case it worked out and right now I'm just starting to dissociate and sequence uh, these animals as well. The third uh, a group of animals that I want to introduce that also live in Roscoff off the shore are the ketogenes. Here, Spadella cephaloptera, for example, that you can see here is an arrowworm that is benthic. It just lives in the seagrass beds, for example, or in stones and in preys on little crustaceans, for example. Um, it has a very a complicated nervous system, as you can see here. So it has a ventral nerve cord, a lot of um, sensory organs that are sometimes not even uh, um, investigated um, uh, properly. 
Um, so it's a quite enigmatic group. Here's the center, uh, here's the cerebral nervous system, for example, here the eyes that you can see here. And I um, have these little critters also here in the lab in, uh, in Vienna and, and culture them, and I'm able to, to do uh, experiments on them and also uh, do dissociations and I did uh, single cell sequencing uh, studies and I'm excited to see what comes out and compare these data then to those ones of the mollusk and the endocrocs at the end. In my new assembly study, uh, I want to study the eye evolution of these critters because they have very different eyes. Um, this is um, a larva that is still in uh, the egg capsule that you can see here. Here's the head and then looks like a tadpole that is just rolled up like this. And um, here you can see visualized by gene expression an opsin xenopsin that is uh, expressed in the eyes of these little critters here. That's the lateral side in la later uh, development stage. And these eyes of this Spadella species that I can keep in the lab are very different to those ones, for example, that uh, Euchronia hamata has. So uh, um, Spadella, you can easily keep in the lab. It is a benthic species that reproduces and so on. But Euchronia is a pelagic species, so it's really difficult to, to, to even um, catch it and not harm it. So you have to go to the place where it exists. So and this is basically somewhere close to the open ocean. Um, both of those critters have very different eyes. Um, uh, Spadella has um, so-called inverted eyes because the photoreceptive elements, the cilia, are um, kept away basically from, from the light. So the light has to go through these cells from the other side and then is absorbed by these uh, options. The case is opposite in Euchronia amata, as you can see here, where basically light is directly um, uh, touching the photoreceptors of these ones. So um, as I mentioned, for this one, I have to go uh, and collect uh, uh, these uh, species somewhere in the open ocean. And that is uh, luckily possible with um, the assembled program. And I hopefully, if Corona allows this, we'll go to uh, the Azores to uh, Horta and will collect at the EMA station together with the skilled uh, people there who know where the uh, ketoconus occur, um, the species. And this is a picture again like of the research vessel and this is Eukona Hamata with some egg capsules inside and so on. And um, this research was especially like the first part with the uh, chitons for the polypacophon was carried out in uh, collaboration with the Arendt lab. Um, and um, I would like to thank Assembler again and all those people and agencies who uh, provided financial support uh, for the help. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, uh, Tim. There are questions. Uh, Liz, Liz Williams, please, you can ask the questions. Hi, Tim. Oh, that was really nice. Nice to see you. Thank you. I have uh, just questions about your chitin larvae. So mm -hmm. do you have any idea how many cells total are in the larvae that you sequence? It's, uh, it's very difficult. Um, we thought about this before. Um, before, So I did my postdoc at Ember in, uh, in Heidelberg and they're working on a, on a worm, on an analyt, which is, has, uh, and the larvae has almost the same size as the drop for larvae of the polyplacophern. And they, I think, estimated it would be around 10,000 cells. Could that be? I, so so 10,000 cells, the nervous system, I think it was, or something like this. So um, I only have estimates, and I, it, it could be the same, something around this. But they almost have the same size, So and they look pretty similar. So uh, um, I, I think it would be in the range of a uh, of uh, Platinelles du Murillu. Okay, and my other little question, a bit off topic, sorry. But do, no do you know what's on the rocks that induces metamorphosis of the chitin larvae? Yeah, this is, uh, I think this, wait, so that's not so difficult. You're a specialist on this. Uh, so I know that there's mostly a uh, lithosomnium on it, like this coralline, uh, color, color, yeah. You know what is it coralline cor algae on there? That's what I, what I wanted to say exactly. Okay. So oh, cool. This is okay. Mostly on those rocks, 
Um, but of course, I have no clue about any uh, other biofilm or anything like this, but um, it is, um, it worked out every time to settle them like this. So Rick, to this question, can I ask you if you found, you know, if you found many chemosensory receptors, because you, you know, you're looking at the chemosensory neurons as well. Uh, are there, you know, um, how many chemosensory receptors you find? Wow, that's a good question. Um, so um, basically, you just have to imagine about this animal, about chitons, um, there was maybe like about another nervous system, uh, another sensory system. There's just basically not a lot of studies. But there's, for example, one sensory system, they're called ampullary systems, and they, I think, are uh, chemosensory. Mm -hmm. it's, so they're in the um, atmosphere of the region, so the head region, basically, and they could be uh, involved, for example, in settlement. But of course, we also have the apical organ. I was not really talking about this, but the apical organ is basically uh, on the on the anterior side, um, and it is uh, made up of many uh, different cell types, and um, it has a ciliary. Uh, um, some some cells are ciliated, and um, there, there could also be a uh, chemoreceptors, most likely there are. And if you can see them when they're in the settlement process, so if they're probing the substratum, they just go down with the apical organ to the uh, substratum, to the rocks, and just seem to taste if, it, if it's a good um, uh, substratum to, uh, to settle down. So what kind of, what do you give them to keep them in the lab? Um, Basically, what I do, I just have uh, the aquarium look really ugly. So, in this sense, that there's uh, not a lot of um, there's a lot of algae growing, a lot of detritus, and so on, and they are just living below the stones. They are active at night, so they just come out. Um, you need um, for the larvae once they hatch, you don't need any um, algae to feed them or so, because they feed on their yolk all the time. Okay. Okay. Reserves. So, in this sense. That is not a problem, but once they set it down, they just feed on, on, on biofilms and so on, everything that is uh, just there. I, I guess they are also feeding on bryozoans and whatever exists in, in, in nature. Um, I have seen like the larvae also eating, uh, I'm sorry, like the settled uh, individuals eating uh, ulva, like this macroalgae ulva. Um, yeah. So this one, but besides that, there's, to my knowledge, not really a, a this hasn't really be, been studied uh, in, in detail. I'm, I'm, I'm happy if somebody else knows anything about this uh, and shares it. Yeah. Okay, and there's more questions. Um, okay, so Pedro, do, do you, uh, I'm not sure if he wants to ask, but uh, the question is there. How do you build the cell type tree? I, I think Pedro Martinez has got some difficulties with the internet so uh, as i'm saying i'm repeating this question how do you yeah. build cell type three so they, there's basically there's basically a pipeline by 10x there's a, a star mapper and so on and so, so there's a pipeline by this one i i couldn't couldn't tell it right now but there's a there's a bioinformatic pipeline of this and uh yeah if if he's interested i can i will figure out and i will just share that information okay thank you any other questions? Uh, is, is there a genome sequence for this, uh, for, for any of these organisms? Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the way, actually. So uh, the genome of Acanthitona clinita, uh, which actually turns out to be a different species, so Acanthitona fascicularis, it's called, um, there's a clinita also lives in the same, in a similar habitat, but, uh, and is, uh, can can be identified by by specialists or so, and I, I know how they look like. But uh, uh, it's uh, the correct name is Acanthitona um, fascicularis, and there's a, um, uh, a genome that is sequenced right now and annotated by the working group also here in Vienna of Anni Wanninger by Andrew Calcino, um, and yeah, that's on the way. This will be published soon, I guess. Uh, for all the other ones, is nothing published. Like for the endoprocts, I have to figure out what kind of species this is. I know it's Loxosomella, um, but I don't really know if it's described yet. Uh, I have the 
specimens. I, I sequence uh, the CO1 uh, uh, sequence of several specimens and I, um, it, it came out always the same sequence basically, but uh, it, it, it's not on, on gen deck yet. But maybe it has been described on morphological, on the morphological level. So this I have to figure out. And for the uh, for Spadella, there has been done some work, but the genome hasn't been sequenced yet. But for all of them, I have transcriptomes. I'm, I'm aiming to do this. Okay. Well, Tim, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, these uh, very peculiar organisms and they're also very informative. And uh, thank you, everyone, all the thank you. presented and accepted to, to give these presentations. And everyone else for, for listening and, and, and watching the, the presentations. So tomorrow we'll be back again. I'll send an email later on just to remind everyone. Thank you and uh, see you tomorrow. The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity and climate change research. EMBRC supported research has already led to novel, high impact research in human health, product and medicine development and aquaculture, and it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders.